the most way for them to distribute content. I find with my clients, uh, I work with a lot of big companies, mid-sized companies all over Europe um, and, and previously all over North America, is um, they either have a really amazing distribution team but not enough content to fill their distribution funnel, or they have a really amazing content team and distribution is an afterthought. Sponsored updates being a distribution medium um, are incredibly important because what I find is that the most amazing content will see the light of day if it doesn't have a great distribution plan behind it. Typically, I spend a lot of time talking about the tactical uh, side of sponsored updates and how to get the best engagement in the feed, how to write your copy, what the copy links should be, et cetera, et cetera. We're not going to go into that today, although if you do have questions along those lines, feel free to pop them into the Q&A and I'll try to get to them. What we are going to cover today are um, trends that I'm seeing in, in the news feed that I'm seeing within the sponsored update product and how companies are using it most effectively. So rather than 2015, top sponsored updates look back where we'd look at the, the best performers that may all have very similar traits. I've done quite a bit of digging into the many, many, many sponsored updates that have been run over the past year um, across the globe and have picked out some trends that I've seen that, that have worked very well um, and that I kind of selected to inspire you to be more effective with your own promotional efforts uh, next year. So let's get started again. Any Q&A questions that you have been turned to the Q&A box, and I will uh, do my best to address them all at the end of the presentation. One uh, trend in content that we've seen for a while is crowdsourcing, user-generated content and poor-generated content. Um, we've seen Red Bull has done this very well, GoPro has done this very well. Lots of consumer brands do this very well with user-generated content where they will run um, a hashtag promotion or they'll ask for, you know, people to submit video or stories or whatever. Um, and we see this less often in a B2B platform. Um, it can be very effective in generating audience engagement and making your audience feel like they are part of your story or part of your efforts. So in this particular example from a Holiday Inn Express, they um, a new CMO or a new creative director, I'm sorry, a new creative director, and um, a series of crowdsourcing or generated content promotions to try to get ideas for um, there for the hotel. Um, this one in particular um, was a YouTube video, no purchase necessary, but it was um, a an infamous, you know, help us name our pancake machine and win a trip. So it was a contest, um, but they end up using the results in their um, initiative and, and kind of continued on into this uh, longer campaign. User-generated content works very well, but again, along the consumer marketing line of, of things, um, the use of memes. So if you look on Pinterest or Instagram or Facebook or any of those social platforms, you see memes everywhere. You see them on LinkedIn. So this particular example from Host Analytics really stands out in what is otherwise um, a very serious news feed. Uh, the interesting thing about this is the article itself is pretty serious and it's pretty typical to what you see on LinkedIn, nine surprising stats about the CFO role. So you see lots of um, career management, role management, job management type stuff on LinkedIn. So think, you know, the future of the CFO, the future of the CEO, that type of thing. Um, the, the news feed, the LinkedIn content ecosystem is full of them. So one way to stand out when you're putting a very similar topic amongst lots of other companies is to simply promote it in a different way. So analytics did this very effectively. They've been running this post for a long time. So that comes up another point here, which is if something is working and it continues to work and you're not seeing a diminishing return on investment, there's really no reason and pull it down. Lots of topics on LinkedIn are evergreen, right? This is not a platform where a topic comes and goes in a matter of hours. There tend to be the same things being discussed uh, for a very long period 
period of time. So this particular post hits on both um, kind of a light, lightweight tone or a lighter tone to engage people in an otherwise serious feed, but also takes on, you know, a very real need of people when they come to LinkedIn, which is career management. And so in a way that, um, that they can continue to kind of promote this one blog post for a very long time and continue to get lots of traffic and traction to an owned content property. The thing that I'm seeing more and more in social media is the use of hyper-targeting and personalization. Um, now, some companies will allow you to create dynamic ads where the copy updates dynamically based on the targeting that you're using, and this works very well if you're using first-party data. On LinkedIn, we have the ability to target by company. So in this example, this company called Breather was targeting Google employees, a very scalable audience, right? There are hundreds of thousands of Google employees or ex-Google employees. Um, and so you can create a single post or a single campaign around this target audience and still get scale, still, still get a meaningful amount of data around it. But because they were targeting one specific company, they made sure to call out the audience that they were targeting um, and just directly address the fact that they were targeting Google employees. Now, some hyper-targeting and personalization on the web feels a little creepy, but in this case, um, um, it worked, right? and there were certainly comments, and hey, I didn't know we had this, thanks for sharing. Um, and it got a really, really great engagement rate, and it did it at scale because it was targeting, it was hyper-targeting at scale. So it was finding that balance between targeting exactly the audience that you want to reach, but doing so at meaningful scale to where your efforts are not wasted and you have enough data to be able to measure and optimize. on LinkedIn. This is another, this may be kind of a rising trend or an occasional trend that we see. There are lots of consumer companies using LinkedIn for all kinds of purposes, uh, but when it comes to marketing, it's certainly less common than, than the B2B use case. So this one uh, is kind of a trend or a standout for me in that it is a consumer brand uses a very recognizable celebrity. So celebrity marketing, celebrity endorsement is not something that you would typically equate with a B2B platform. But in this case, you've got a consumer brand, a great celebrity endorsement. Um, and it certainly stood out as being only one of a few in its category, not a lot of promotion um, from this industry on LinkedIn, although certainly professionals are consumers too, um, and, a, and a kind of a, an engaged and, um, I guess, employed audience may be uh, a really, really great thing for more consumer brands to try in the coming year. This one is from Intel IT Center. So Intel IT Center has the Intel the Showcase page called the Intel IT Center on LinkedIn. They chose to launch a showcase page because they wanted to hone in on an IT decision maker audience um, with a steady stream of all in content to keep this audience engaged with content that was only relevant for, for them. Right? Intel has a lot of different products, a lot of different business lines, a lot of different audiences. So one way for them to effectively segment out an, an audience was to create a showcase page around it and create a steady stream of always on organic and paid content to engage and, and communicate with that audience. Intel does a lot of different types of content, some helpful, some serious, some lightweight. This particular post uses humor to, to promote an otherwise serious topic. So, so the intro copy says, these common mistakes can trip up CIOs. So again, we're talking about being a more effective C-suite professional, just like the analytics CFO post. This is an Intel IT Center CIO post that also uses humor to address what could otherwise be a very serious or very dry topic. And the, the, the humor is, is the, at least the copy in the um, is I've decided to micro praise instead of micromanage. Everything you've done for the last 30 seconds is outstanding. Very lightweight. You can see here in the post hundreds of likes, um, some comments. Um, we don't give share metrics on a post, but there are probably a good, good bit of errors associated with this as well. So lots of viral activity, lots of earned media, um, and the article does go to the Intel, uh, Intel page, so they're driving traffic to an owned, to an owned property, um, but doing so more effectively by using humor to stand out in the news feed. Video is um, certain video use by marketing 
thing is, is certainly on the rise this year, and there are lots of studies that show it will continue to be on the rise next year. Lynn does see a fair bit of video, although it doesn't have a native ad, uh, video player in and of itself. Certain platforms like Vimeo, YouTube, and SlideShare will play natively in the feed. So this example from Air Canada is one that uses YouTube. They've embedded the video into the news feed so that you don't have to leave LinkedIn to play the video. Um, so definitely one best practice. Next best practice, though, is it's just a really beautiful video. A lot of B2B videos open uh, with somebody at a conference, and it's a shot, and you can tell they're about to speak on a product or about the industry. Um, and that may work if somebody's already engaged with your company and they want to hear about your company and they want to see what's going on at your trade shows and, and what's happening in the industry, that may work. Uh, but when you're promoting something to a broad audience that may or may not know who you are, may or may not be following you, it's definitely better to use video to entertain, to engage, to inspire. Um, and this video from Air Canada, which is kind of a behind the scenes on their premier food service, works really well. It's, it's really beautifully shot and it makes you hungry, which is not something that you typically associate with airplane food, they've done a really nice job here. So I really like this campaign from Erica, and it's a great example of how to effectively use video in the feed. So kind of along the video and visual marketing trend, infographics, I saw an article a couple of years ago that claims that the infographic is, was dead and that could not have been more wrong. I continue to see infographics regularly being used across all, all social media platforms, especially on LinkedIn, where companies tend to like to throw out stats and figures and research reports and things like that. What I'm seeing with infographics is an improvement in the quality of the infographic. There, a poorly created infographic can be detrimental because it's not memorable, it doesn't tell a story, it doesn't actually convey information in a concise way, which is what an infographic is supposed to do. So I chose this example from Simply Learn because Simply Learn as a marketing organization regularly does a good job of using infographics and data to promote its programs. This is an education-based example, and the call to action is to enroll for, um, for a big data program. So for a lot of EDU or education marketers, they very much need to be direct response focused and have a clear call to action. But rather than just saying, hey, here's what we can do for you, it's providing a little bit of information to their target audience. It's just what can we do for you, but what are the benefits of this program? Infographic can be a really nice way to convey several points of data in a nice visual format, which is really great for social and really great for a, a, a news feed where people are scrolling through and it's hard to catch their attention. This is a nice example of an infographic done well, um, an infographic that is used to kind of drive further action. Continuing along the visual trend, no content marketing list would be complete without GE. They are everywhere. And they have long been known for their visual branding as much as anything else. So it's not surprising that when I was looking around our sponsored updates campaigns for a really great visual example, that one of the most compelling examples came from GE. It's just a beautiful image. The intro copy says, the laser is hot, the water is cold. Put them together and the results are amazing. So they're using pretty compelling copy, but they're using an image that adds to the context of the post. It's not just a stock image um, that has been thrown in there because you need something that is compelling in the feed. It's an image that actually illustrates the point of the content and adds context. And beautifully done. So uh, follow GE for sure on LinkedIn if you're looking for more great examples of visual marketing. This is one that I think deserves a little bit more of a voiceover, and that is brands finding a voice on the LinkedIn publishing platform. So for those of you on the call who are not familiar with the LinkedIn publishing platform, it is essentially an extension of our influencer program. A couple of years ago, we launched our influencer program where we got some of the biggest names in business and, and politics and leadership to contribute proprietary content to LinkedIn. We then opened up the publishing platform to all members globally um, with an English profile. 
and we're continuing to expand the publishing platform next year into other languages. But for now, anybody can create an English language profile and start publishing in English on the publishing platform. We have over 150,000 articles being published per week right now. Millions of users are using the publishing platform to write long form articles or longer form um, status updates. Uh, so it is a native, it's essentially a native blogging platform. So individuals have been using this pretty effectively to elevate their own professional brand or to share knowledge with their own networks. Uh, this is a great example from Marriott. They have a showcase page called Overheard at Marriott where they have tapped a number of executives, individual contributors, employees to write regularly on the publishing platform. And those articles then get shared through the showcase page and promoted out through sponsored updates. So this is a way for a company to showcase its expertise, uh, to showcase uh, the fact that it has subject matter experts in the worlds of business and travel through the employee voice. So rather than an article coming from the Mayotte corporate blog, this is coming from an individual blog, but the individual happens to work for Marriott, and it's being filtered in or, or fed in through the showcase page. So there, are, there are two benefits here. The person that's writing the article gets that visibility on their own professional profile. Marriott also gets to use that employee-generated content for, um, for its own communication efforts. Search on LinkedIn for overheard at, using the ampersand sign, overheard at Marriott, you can find their showcase page and check out lots of great examples of um, employees that have written great articles. And they've all, most of them have been promoted out through sponsored updates, some of them have been tagged into Pulse and gotten their own kind of visibility um, that way. But this is a really great example of using employee generated content um, or employee stories to, to promote a brand. Clear. I'm hoping that there will be lots of Q&A at the end. Um, but the final trend here is a mix of evergreen and topical content. So I mentioned at the beginning that if an article is doing well, there's really no reason to pull it down, right? Certain topics will always be popular on LinkedIn. Anything around career management, industry trends, future of the industry, anything that helps your audience be more productive and successful will always have a place on LinkedIn. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can only do evergreen content. There is still room for topical content on LinkedIn. So this example from Ernst Young is the expansionary budget for 2016. And it's an infographic, it's topical, it's timely, um, and when you are trying to demonstrate thought leadership, when you are trying to demonstrate subject matter expertise, you have to have both a long-term view and stay on top of current trends and current, and current issues. So this example from Ernst & Young is one most in a series of many that is tropical, where the rest of their posts may be kind of longer term or evergreen trend that I'm seeing in happening this year and into next is, is companies focusing less on creating loads of content and companies focusing more on getting more mileage out of the content that they already have. This example from EY kind of fits perfectly into that second bucket. The expansionary budget for 2016, that's a massive report, right? This is a massive piece of content that you can pull lots of insights out of. So you can create an infographic that summarizes some of the stats. Top 10 list from, from them is a good example. You can write a blog on your, on your own corporate blog. You can write an employee blog on one of your executives' uh, LinkedIn profiles. You can do a webcast, you can do a series of things around a single piece of content. So that's kind of the mix of evergreen and topical is kind of just a relay into the mix of taking you know, big pieces of content, big meaty pieces of content, and just getting more use out of them by breaking them out into smaller pieces and presenting them in lots of different ways and lots of different formats. So we've gone through, through all of those top 10 trends me. Um, I'd say the key takeaways for me here are mix it. LinkedIn is, is a, you know, really a B2B platform. It's certainly a professional platform. It's the only social platform globally that focuses exclusively um, 
on professionals and a professional mindset. That doesn't mean that your content has to be boring. It doesn't mean that your content has to only be cerebral or or serious in nature. You have to remember that people are on LinkedIn to be more productive and successful, but it is still social media. And social copy tends to have a more lightweight and personal tone. So the less you make it about you, you the more you make it about your audience and think about connecting with them on an emotional level, the more successful you will be in creating that community, building advocacy, and effectively getting engagement on your content in the feed. I'll go ahead and open up the Q&A box to look at questions that we may answer. Hi, it's Issa here. So I can actually feel some of the questions to you if you like. Um, that was a great session. I love any session that references good examples of using humor in B2B. Um, so thanks for sharing that example. First question we have, someone is looking for Someone's going to learn a bit more about best practices on reach or the CTR URL. So you to know is it better to use picture or video or link um, in that type of post? Looking to drive traffic away from LinkedIn, um, the best way to do that would be URL, right? A link. Based post because if you're using video and you're embedding the video into the feed, they're simply going to engage with the video and the feed and not click away. So things like infographics and video are great for engaging people in the feed, people who are too busy or are on mobile and don't necessarily want to click out of the app or click out of the experience. But if you do want to drive traffic away from LinkedIn, um, a large format image with a clear call to action in the copy is the best way to do that. It's the clear call to action is the most important part because if all you have is that large format image and a little bit of intro copy, it's simply not clear to people where they're going to click through to. And the best way to earn engagement is to make it very clear what the member can expect when they click on your post. Is it a long article? Is it a short article? Is it a video? Are they going to your blog? Et cetera, et cetera. So make it clear that this is a destination away from LinkedIn and create a clear call to action with, you know, learn more and a URL that's embedded in the post. It's probably the way. Um, so we have a, kind of a product specific question here. So someone's just looking for clarification on the difference between direct sponsored content and sponsored updates. Good question. So sponsored updates are or get updates that you put on your company page that you then sponsor out to a broader audience. Direct spot content is essentially what Facebook calls dark posting. It is putting sponsored content directly into the feed of your desired audience without putting it on your company page first. So a sponsored update starts on the company page and gets sponsored out from there. Direct sponsored content doesn't have to go on the company page. It can be created directly in the campaign manager tool um, and sponsored directly into the feed. Okay, perfect. And if uh, anyone has any further questions or clarification on that, just get back to us. So another question here is around strategies that you would employ to move B2B away from newsletters and then on to publishing on LinkedIn. So away from subscribing to your newsletter and more towards subscribing to your LinkedIn to, to you on LinkedIn. So uh, I actually would continue to try both. The reason is you can follow somebody as a publisher on LinkedIn. Um, the notification process for when somebody that you're following posts something is not it's not, well, it, it, no push mechanism, right? So if you're following somebody on LinkedIn as a publisher, when you log into your LinkedIn account, you will see a notification that they've published an article. But you typically don't get mails prompting you to log in and read that article. Where LinkedIn is trying to actually reduce the number of emails that it sends to its members, so we're doing more digest and things like that and less one-offs. Um, and because of that, you, you really have to rely on a follower being 
being active on LinkedIn. So if you're publishing on the LinkedIn publishing platform weekly, you are only going to get weekly notifications out to those who use the platform weekly, right? Um, so I definitely, you know, I feel that some companies are trying to move away from newsletters because email is becoming just more cluttered and less effective. But there certainly is still something to be said about kind of using all available distribution methods. So what I tend to recommend to my clients is, unless thing is just absolutely not working for you anymore, don't kill it completely. Just take the same article and publish it everywhere that your audience is. So put into your newsletter for those that are still reading your emails, put it onto your LinkedIn profile through the publishing platform. If it makes sense for your corporate blog, put it there too. Don't just take a piece of content that, or message that you want to get out, put it into one format and pray that people read it there. Put it into as many different formats as you can and distribute it out as many different places as you can or as you need to in order to get the best reach for your audience. I think that's kind of the point, right? It's fragmented distribution. If you have something that's really important to say, you're going to have to say it so many times that you're sick of hearing yourself saying it. By the time you're sick of hearing yourself saying it, you've probably just started to actually connect with your audience. Okay, so we're getting quite a few questions coming in now on poll specifically. So um, one uh, of our attendees says that, you know, currently there's no way to search for specific content on LinkedIn polls and that their company would have a few publishers efforts on specific now topics, but that they're concerned it won't, the efforts won't warrant the return, uh, as there are so many uh, post posts out there. So okay. how do you think Yep. I think there's, good, there's a good, um, there's something, the differentiation between the publishing platform and Pulse. Pulse is a news aggregator. It does pull in articles from the publishing platform and from the influencer program but it does still pull in articles from third-party news sources like Harvard Business Review, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, et cetera. So it's just a news aggregator. So when you download the Pulse app or you see your Pulse aggregator in your news feed, that's simply a recommendation engine for channels that you're following, publishers that you're following, individuals that you're following, influencers that you're following, et cetera. It's just an aggregator. Platform articles can get tagged into a Pulse channel. Most of them don't, though. The vast majority of articles on the publishing platform don't get tagged into Pulse. The way articles on the publishing platform get tagged into Pulse are through our editorial team. So we have a team of Pulse editors that manually look at and manage a queue and manually tag articles into Pulse channels, and they do this based on, is this editorial, is it well-written, um, is it getting early organic engagement, and does it make sense for the content that we would normally see in this given Pulse channel. So for a company that wants to start getting its employees active on the publishing platform, you can make sure that they have editorial support so that their articles are well written. You do want to give them some best practices like keep it editorial in nature, don't make it sound like a press release, that kind of a thing. That will increase your chances for getting tagged into the polls. But the best way to get visibility on those articles is to promote them out through your own channels, through your company page, through your newsletters, through your corporate blog, through your internal communication. Well, that was a long answer to a short question. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. So um, we have another question here. So someone is saying that they currently produce a weekly newsletter via WordPress for their customers, um, but that they only share the link on LinkedIn to so how to get more users to follow them on LinkedIn rather than via their traditional email distribution. Um, so it's kind of a, a broad question generally about getting uh, LinkedIn followers and trying to use that as a base outside of their own kind of customer database that they have for sending emails. So the, the top ways to get followers to your LinkedIn company page are to use the follow plugin. So if you go to developer.linkedin.com, you'll find our plugins. And so there is a simple, that's the social plugin, follow us on LinkedIn kind of thing. Put that on your web page, put that on your email, put them at the bottom of your email newsletters. Um, and be very proactive and say, like, we are, you know, we're, we put a lot more on LinkedIn than we do in our newsletters to so do 
up to the latest and greatest, make sure you follow us here. Uh, make it very clear that that is a place where they can expect to receive regular and quality communication from you. A uh, second way to get more followers to your LinkedIn page is to simply run a follow campaign. So we have native ads that um, are designed to be a one-click follow. So you can run a, a LinkedIn follow ads campaign through your LinkedIn account executive. And then the third way is as a byproduct of sponsored updates. So you run a sponsored updates campaign. If the content is, is, is telling and engaging to where people would want to see more from you, roughly 8-10% of the click session on your sponsored update will go towards that follow call to action. So you can see in the screenshot here from EY, that follow call to action in the upper right hand corner, um, on the mobile device that just turns into a plus sign, the 8 to 10 percent of the clicks on, on a sponsored update will go towards that follow call to action when a post is, is really kind of interesting and relevant to the audience. So plug in on all your own channels, and then through sponsored updates or follow ad campaigns are the three primary ways that I see people um, growing their follower base on LinkedIn. So um, we have more questions. So if you're still okay for time, Jay, we can continue on? We're absolutely okay for time. We are only at uh, just over half past the hour. Right. So someone here is looking for specific advice on how best to use the university LinkedIn pages to engage with alumni and other key people that they may wish to target? Uh, so university pages are interesting. I think for the education sector, there are, you still have to maintain a university page and a company page. The ring being you can't run sponsored updates from the university page at the moment. So anything that you're doing to an, an audience that's um, not already following you needs to come from a company page. The alumni or the, the university page is a great way to engage with alumni and prospects. People tend to find university pages on LinkedIn um, through their networks. So making sure that those who are already following your university page are sharing out the content that you post there is the best way to get more people to follow that. From an alumni relations perspective, actually one piece of advice that I might give, do a group search on LinkedIn because a lot of um, alumni networks are still happening on the groups platform. So if you do, if you're working for Oxford, for example, do a group search for Oxford alumni, and you'll find that there are member-generated groups there. And you can just either send a message to the administrator or join the group and post a message that there is, you know, a, a university page that um, people that are in their, that group can be can be following for updates from from the actual organization. Great, and actually, we have another question then from someone who's in the public sector, government bodies. So I suppose it's not your traditional B2B audience like the education sector. So is there anything there, any examples you've seen or any advice that you would have for someone looking to use the platform where that works for a government body? Absolutely. So I gave a presentation in Washington, D.C. earlier, and in my research I found um, U.S. Chamber of Commerce was running a showcase page to connect with small business owners. So check out U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We also do lots of work with European government organizations here, military organizations, etc., cetera, um, because of the targeting that is available on LinkedIn. So the way to understand LinkedIn's targeting is to go to linkedin.com slash ads and just click on Get Started. You don't have to actually put down any money in order to start playing around with our targeting capabilities. But you'll find that things like um, defense sector, aviation, um, think tanks, um, executive office, legislative office, there are certain industries, sectors, job titles, skills that you can target that are right in line with how a government organization or public sector organization might wish to communicate with its key audiences. Um, I kind of think of an, a European government example of a company page showcase page or initiative. I will have to get back to you on the LinkedIn content hashtag. Um, since I've only been in, in region for a few months, nothing comes to mind immediately, but I can certainly ask around and, and get you an example. Okay. So 
Um, there's another question here, which I know you kind of touched on already, but I guess someone's just looking for a bit of advice on where do they start when they want to publish a long form post. You just go to your um, your profile, and they're you're on like the desktop version, for example, linkedin.com, your home page. There are three buttons at the top. If you have, it has to be the English language version of your profile. I will say that. But at the top, there is uh, share an update, share a photo, or write a post. Those are three actions that you can take when sharing things out with your network. You simply click on the one to the right, set up a post, click on it. Pops the publishing platform. It's pretty similar to like a WordPress or um, any other kind of public content management system where you upload an image, you write a headline, it's HTML based, it's pretty basic editing functions in terms of formatting. Um, then you hit save or publish, and there you go. <laughs> you can save it as a draft, so if you want to get other eyeballs on it or you want to come back later for editing and reviewing, you can do that. You can write it, save it, and come back later. You don't have to publish right away. I think our last question of this session is around, you mentioned you know, having employees share content, etc. Have you seen any organizations that have been going to drive that internally? and ways that you can kind of get the troops behind it so that people outside of say, the marketing department would also be enough to want to uh, share and engage in the content that their company is producing? Yeah, we have a few tips. When we're getting organizations started with employee engagement, the first is have some executive sponsorship, right? Have some have some C-suite execs or some at least some V-level execs that are bought into the program that are willing to put their own profile behind it and do some of their own writing. Um, the second is start small. Don't try to start with a large percentage of the organization. Find the people in your organization that are already socially engaged and active who kind of already get the benefits of being active on social media um, and arm them with editorial calendar, some examples of what they might write about, um, and get them publishing regularly. Those, the When you start writing on the publishing platform and you start seeing engagement, it's pretty addictive. Um, um, just any other form of social media can be, right, appeals directly to the ego and the kind of that um, need for immediate gratification. But also it can be something that you use in internal communications for gamification. Right, so for example, in the LinkedIn newsletters that we receive from corporate communications, there is usually a list of employee published articles. Here's some articles that your employees have written recently that you think you might we might want to read. They're usually the ones around career management or inspiration, that kind of thing would be helpful to a broad audience, but it's nice to see that other people in the organization are active on the publishing platform um, and to see what happens when you put your own voice or your own name behind something. So get executive involvement, start small, find the social engaged people, um, and then get them to be your advocates and to grow the program from there. Great. Um, so I think that means we have come close to the 11.45 mark, so I think we can call it. Well, actually, for a few questions have actually come in directly to my Q&A, so I'm going to go ahead and address those of the broad audience. Um, the first one's from Charlie. I usually recommend we don't have hashtags on our posts on LinkedIn. Should I rethink this? And is there a good reason aside from on the Pulse platform? So Pulse doesn't, Pulse tagging actually does not work um, based on hashtags. We never use just hashtags, but it can be something that helps with um, article search. So you sparingly, I wouldn't recommend a post with three, four, or five hashtags like you would see on Instagram or Twitter. Um, it's a bit excessive. Keep it simple. Keep it professional. But I, at this point, I wouldn't stay away from them entirely. Especially if it's part of an overall campaign where you're cross-promoting between LinkedIn and Twitter, one unifying hashtag can really help with those cross-promotional efforts. Another one from Chris Kellier, what studies do you have to show that video content is working? Um, one of the reasons Instagram and Snapchat works is because they offer 10 to 15 second videos. On the other hand, most people love the skip ad button on YouTube where um, the first to second mark is key. So stack a video on LinkedIn. Um, because it's not, 
a native capability, it's an embed capability, it's not as engaging on LinkedIn as um, content, right? So you may not see as high of an engagement rate on video as you would on an infographic, generally speaking. However, um, video can still work on LinkedIn. I think the best way to get good engagement with video on LinkedIn is to set, your, set an expectation with your audience on how long the video will be because there are really long videos on LinkedIn and there are really short videos on LinkedIn. Right? I think the reason that it works so well on Snapchat or Vine or Instagram is because you know it's going to be short. There's an expectation there that long-form video is just not accepted on those platforms, whereas when you go to YouTube, there is an expectation that it will be a longer video that you're investing more time in, whereas on LinkedIn, there's no expectation on length right now because we haven't set any limits on that. So you have to be very clear audience, how long is the video and what are they going to get out of it, not just, hey, well, watch this video on this topic. That's my, my piece of advice for the moment. I will let you know if that changes. It probably will. Things change on LinkedIn all the time. Um, I think that is about all I can accommodate now. Um, yeah, that's about it for, for right now, guys. If you have anything else, hashtag LinkedIn content, and I'll try to follow up within the 24 hours. Otherwise, the recording and the presentation will be sent out, as Eva mentioned. Thank you so much for attending. Have a great holiday.